Hi, my name is Rick Howe. I'm a TV guy, and this is my new show called Inside Television. It's the story about how the television business got to where it is today and where it's going. I hope you enjoy it. Stay tuned. I am pleased to welcome everybody to welcome everybody to the premiere episode of Inside Television. And my guest today is Trig Marin, and you've all heard of him. And we're going to talk about his life in the world of television. Trig, how are you? I'm I'm just fine. Uh, getting old, but I'm, I'm just fine. You know, dude, it it, it it sort of happens to all of us. Okay. We were talking about uh, your world and, and see if I can remember all the things. You are a television, certainly a television pioneer, cable pioneer. You're a philanthropist, an investor, a media owner. And oh, by the way, you were chairman and CEO of American Television and Communications, uh, where I started in the business. I get all that right? So far, we're doing great. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so now ATC, uh, which was based in Denver, and you had another life before you uh, jumped the shark, as they say, and decided to join our crazy business. Uh, but ATC was based in Denver, and a majority owner of ATC at one point was Time, Inc., and then you engineered the evolution of time cable ATC into Time Warner, right? Right. Okay. Right. Yeah. I want to go back to how in the world did you decide to join this insane business? Uh, good. Good question. Um, glad. <laughs> glad. I. Glad I did. Uh, but I had I had gone uh, you know from a small town boy in Pennsylvania up through through Dartmouth and Amos Talk and four years in the Navy as a naval officer and all that kind of stuff and then went to work for Procter and Gamble uh, and uh, learned a lot about about marketing. Uh, uh, but at, when I was um, thirty five years old, uh, I had. Uh, what was thought to be a heart attack. Oh my. Yeah. And so I took better part of nine months off from doing almost anything and decided that I'd go work for a small media company out, out in a small media company yes. out, out in um, Del Mar, California. Okay. Called CRM, which stood for communications research machines. Yes. Uh, with a lot of um, ties to universities in Southern California and so on. We were, we were a book, we made books, primarily textbooks. Right. We had, we had magazines, we made films. Um, and I became president of the company uh, after a little bit. Um, so getting back into the rat race again, <laughs> a little. Um, and then a fellow named Monty Rifkin came to see me. Monroe Rifkin. That's right. Monroe, yep. Monroe Rifkin, who, who uh, interestingly enough, is the father of uh, one of my sons-in-law, uh, the oldest of my sons-in-law, who's married to my older daughter. There you go. Yes. Yeah, so so it's, every, it's always been a sort of a family business, cable. Yeah, hadn't it? Every, okay. Everything worked out in the end. Uh, but I, I thought long and hard about whether I should do that. Um, uh, and I'd had other offers while I was out in California, um, uh, but this one w was was quite intriguing because it it gave me the opportunity I thought to be sort of out ahead of the curve of the technological curve because these people uh, the the company that Monty was running had had various directors like like um, Arthur, Arthur Little, okay. Yeah. Uh, and and uh, a Collier Crum, who was a um, an assistant professor at Harvard Business School, and and ver various others uh, who all seemed to be getting behind the eight ball. So I, I called a couple of people. One was Amos Hostetter. Yeah. Okay. But but, but Hostetter, who who had started Continental Cable and was very much into the business. Uh, another was Fred Reinert. Uh, who was an old 
high school friend of mine who I'd played basketball with. Okay. Uh, whose dad, as it turned out, was in the cable business. I never really realized that while I was in high school. I just had no idea. But yeah. his dad started way back um, in the very, very early days of cable. And um, this was about 1974, I think, when Monty Rifkin called me. I joined up in 75. Right. Uh, and after Monty and I had gone back and forth a few times, and and, uh, uh, and that was... That was uh, I just looked at this industry as, as a, uh, something that was a little bit ahead of its time um, and struggling, uh, as a matter of fact, uh, in some ways. But um, I thought, you know, this, this, this could really be fun and really be interesting. And interestingly enough, I was a ski racer in college ah. at Dartmouth. And I, I said... Denver, Colorado. Yeah, better now, snow. <laughs> now, now, now we're talking. <laughs> <laughs> so anyway, as with many decisions like like this that I think most most people make, uh, I was making a decision that I thought, given all the considerations, would work. There you and go, it, and it did. And you came in seventy five. Now that was. I started at ATC in 73, right out of college, and right. I worked for Tom Crowley, who came in to the system I was in in Columbus, Ohio. He yeah. popped up to the corporate office at Denver and brought me right. in. I, br I brought him. As, as you I, got there. I brought him to the corporate office. Did you? I'm in, right. I, I needed somebody in, the, in, that, in that job on, on the marketing side uh, who'd, who'd had system experience, et cetera. Yeah, 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 yeah. Because I, I came in, in as somebody who, who'd had Procter & Gamble marketing experience, which I think at the time was probably the best marketing experience you could get. It probably uh, still is. And, and uh, uh, I, I was lucky to be, you know, to, to be in that, that position because most of the people in the industry then were engineers and right. financial people, construction, operations, so on that, and that that was that was the business. There wasn't a lot. There was no understanding of programming, uh, and and there there was not a lot of um, uh, a lot of people who'd had deep marketing experience. Uh, and I was fortunate enough to have that at the point. I think I was. Let's see, seventy-five. I would have been about uh, thirty-seven years old, something like that. Now, time. when you got there, yeah. were you astonished at how little we actually had to sell? I mean, our, we uh, didn't have a whole lot of product beyond, you know, better pictures back then. Yes, no, you, you're 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 right about that. Uh, I I was I was not astonished, but surprised, <laughs> uh, and and also surprised at the at the hesitation of people to do things. Yep. Uh, because it was, as I say, financial people, engineers, et cetera. Uh, and they just, and I think Monty and, and his directors, who his, the, his people on his board in American television, which by the way, was at that time, a very, very small um, over the counter stock. Yeah. Um, that was, uh, they, they did have some vision. And they said, you know, if we're ever going to go from here to there, we'd better we'd better be doing some more things. And, you know, we've got to get into the big cities. We have to we have to have have product that will interest people in the big cities, because, as you, as you remember, we were bringing. In most most of our business, we were bringing to small uh, um, what I would call suburban and exurban areas. Yeah. For, yeah. Exurban. Yeah. We were bringing signal from the big cities. When I all, was all, when I when region. I started in Columbus, what we had to sell was better pictures on the local Columbus stations. But we brought in by microwave independent stations from get ready for this Cleveland. Now we're talking big city, <laughs> <laughs> you know. And 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 I remember doing a doing a radio commercial in Columbus where I I played the theme music for Danny Thomas's Make Room for Daddy, which was, you know, one of the shows on Channel 49 out of Cleveland. And right. and and my sales pitch was the way they were 
is the way we are. Now that'll 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 fire up your engines, won't it? <laughs> now, speak <laughs> speaking of product, I do remember uh this guy from Atlanta came in and met with us in the corporate office. Ted Turner came in and you were there to pitch us on carrying his satellite WTCG yeah. channel well, 17 I'll, I'll, out of Atlanta. I'll tell you, which became WTBX. That's right. Right. And, and it became and, Turner and then right. so I, more I interesting. <laughs> could tell you tell you about that. Good grief. Uh well, first, first, let's go back to the point where in late 75, after I had joined, um, it wasn't late. In fact, it may have been even May or something, because I joined right about the beginning of the year. Um, we uh, had the Thriller from Manila. Yep. Uh, it, w- it was, uh, let's see, was it Foreman and Ali? I'm trying, yeah, trying that's to. That's right, on HBO. Yeah. Yeah, and and uh, it was a two part uh, programming uh, that e- that evening, which was the first satellite delivered programming, and it went two places. It went to Jackson, Mississippi, which was one of our systems. Yep. Uh, and it went to Fort Pierce, uh, Vero Beach, Florida, which was UA Columbia Systems, Bobby Rosencrantz, that group, um, at the same time. And uh, that was a very interesting period because we had never had that kind of programming before. And, and it was the Thriller from Manila, uh, and, and which by the way, was a hell of a fight. Uh, <laughs> and, or it could have been, could have been Ali and Frazier. I mean, I'm trying to remember with Frazier or Foreman. All right. But, but, uh, uh, but in any event, as our, <clears throat> once that was over, then we showed a movie because we were become, going to become a, HBO is going to become a major movie purveyor. Yeah. And the movie was Alice's Restaurant. You um, can get anything you want at Alice's Restaurant. Yes, exactly. Exactly. <laughs> exactly. Uh, and that was, and that was very, very popular. I think it was Helen Burstyn and, and um, oh God, who was it? Well, Arlo yeah. Guthrie, certainly. Yeah, Arlo, yes. So, it was so his that, song. <laughs> yes, yes, exactly. So that was that was the that was the beginning of of uh, where marketing started to come in, and where, and certainly where programming, which was essential if you're going to do the marketing, you had to have something to sell, as you suggested earlier. Yeah, and we had something to sell. And we sold it for, I think, um, uh, might have been eight dollars at that point. Yeah. Teleprompter a few weeks later decided that they would do the same the same thing into one of their systems, and and they they decided to sell for twelve dollars. And I looked as closely as I could at the numbers that we were achieving and we were doing better than they were, even though they were in a, in a system that had better demographics. Right. And so when I think they may have gone to $10 they may have gone to $10. And then the next two systems that were launched that I can think of were because I was watching teleprompter, which was fairly big at that time, watching them, um, and to see what their reaction would be. And they went to $12 in their next system saying, uh, you know, that we could reap even more money per subscriber. Yep. And we went up to Rochester, New York, and we did it for $4. The idea being, you know, the standard old marketing idea that you, you need to sample people. Yeah, that's right. And, and once you sample them, uh, if you have something that's really valuable to them, you can start raising the price over a period of time. Uh, and so we took a different tack and we did dramatically better than they did uh, in that period. So I had started to get some believers in the company on the idea that, hey, well, maybe this marketing thing, maybe there's something to this. Uh, <laughs> so in, in those days, my my strongest memory of, of ATC at corporate was, I think it was Orlando Brilliante in one of the Florida systems. And we were launching Channel 17 down there. 
Right. So I helped him organize a marketing campaign. I think we created the graphics in, in Denver. That's by the way, when I was sharing an office with Priscilla Walker and, and Brill, his attitude was you run a special promotion for a week and you stop it because you don't dare. And I think all it was was free installation, but you know, that's a big deal. We had a truck roll and everything else. And I had, I had real honest to God fights with him. I would get to the office at seven in the morning in Denver. So I could get him at the phone at nine and kind of let him know, know, we were serious about this stuff. (laughs) And as it turned out, I think we ran that promotion for 18 weeks and every week it kept generating positive results. And, you know, it was just a, a different, I mean, the world was driven at ATC, certainly, by cash flow. Everything right. was cash flow. Yes, and exactly. spending any more money that right. damaged the cash flow hit everybody in their back pocket. Right. And, and no understanding about how, when you have a new product, you've got to expand the market. And, you, and you've got, I mean, there was none of, none of that type of understanding. But, but yes, you you. You've got it. You know, if you talk about Ted Turner and and uh, WTCG becoming WTBS, right? He uh, in Atlanta. Uh, you may remember, uh, I'm sure you do, that 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 was a very controversial situation. And and he Ted came to see us as remember at the office, but he he. And Monty and I went out and had a meeting sitting in the old Denver airport uh, in the TWA lounge, yep. which unfortunately did not. And we had we had private access to the lounge. I'd made sure that we had would have private access because we needed to talk about some tough stuff with Ted. And uh, the uh, the lounge was was uh, surrounded uh, not by thick walls. It, it actually had shutters that you would pull down. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Unfortunately, the sound would come out. And, <laughs> and, and Ted started throwing some F-bombs in Well, there, Ted, so. Ted had kind of a loud voice. And <laughs> yes, he, yes, he did. And, he, <laughs> and he, he, could, he could project an F-bomb really far. Yes. So we had, we had this long discussion, and, and, and it was, it was pretty, pretty rowdy. And Monty, Monty Rifka is not a rowdy guy. Um, and I, I unfortunately had spent four years as a naval officer, so I had had some understanding. You could curse uh, like a sailor. <laughs> yes, exactly. So, so we went back and forth. Uh, and uh, on the on the road back, Monty said to me, and because Ted had not been able to launch yet, okay, right. and the question was who was going to get together with him and launch. He needed and I, us, and I believe that we were the first to do so. Yeah, okay, that's right. But one of the big questions at the time was. Is it legal for him to do that? Because once he launches that station, he's taking it nationwide and he only has the programming rights for Atlanta. Yep. Okay. Uh, Wow. Uh, Is that legal? So we spent a lot of time talking to lawyers, communications lawyers. At the time, the communications bar in in Washington, D.C. was the largest bar in Washington, (laughs) D.C. Yeah. And, And... uh, and we talked to a number of key people back there, and every one of them gave us the advice that we could do it with him if, if you know, if he wanted to send it down to us. We would not be the transgressor; he would be. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Or, or the people that he took it from, who was the fellow in Tulsa. Oh God, what was his name? Um, who had set up a station to pick up Ted's. Right. Uh, a ground station to pick up Ted's signal and send it back up to the satellite. Um, and uh, that name will come to me maybe tomorrow, but yeah. in, in any event, uh, that, that uh, we decided, we made a decision. Look, we're never going to have anything unless we take this risk of putting, you know, going along with Ted. We're not putting it up there, but we are receiving it. And we started to work with, with him. And then others started to work with him. And then, wow, all of a yeah. sudden we had something because we not only had Atlanta Braves baseball, which, by the way, caused another huge hiccup in my life with what we did here. Um, 
And if, 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 if we have time to talk about it, I'll tell you about getting the Rockies franchise to Denver and everything <laughs> that I went, okay. I went through with the National League to make that happen. Uh, but uh, we, we um, the, the owners, the owners were not happy with the first group that I put forward, who were all the cable guys in Denver. They said, no, if that's the group, you, you're not getting it. There were six six bidding and, and we, we had to win. Uh, anyway, Ted Turner uh, really made a difference in the business. And one of the things I found about Ted, um, he's obviously moved, moved around in the, the circles of women uh, fairly freely, okay? But he was extraordinarily honest uh, with me and everybody I knew. I mean, you made a deal, you shook his hand, that was a deal, no matter yeah. how hard it was for him, which is why he got into trouble at one point when he made it made a deal for the MGM library. Um, yes. And, and, and they, they had basically cooked their books by not showing some of the deals they had for the long-term use of some of the films. The residuals so, and everything else, yeah. The residuals, so that so that the library was really a lot worth less than 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 it had been, uh, uh, than the deal had thought, and that certainly that Ted had thought, which is the reason why, at the point where Ted got into trade, he got into financial trouble because of that, and he called on um, John Malone and myself and a couple of other people to come on his board. Uh, and we bailed him out of that, which allowed him to continue. Uh, but he could have gotten out of that by suing, right? But uh, the, uh, regarding the, you know, the, the lack of value uh, uh, that that had been hidden uh, in the negotiation process, he did. He didn't. He said we shook hands on the deal. It's done. Bang. Uh, so that that was that was that was uh, essential, Ted. Uh, and in terms of, uh, of uh, his impact on the industry, I think it was it was stunningly important. Absolutely. I mean, and, he... and, and Ted's not doing very well right now, by the way, not doing well at all, uh, which is unfortunate. Yep. I remember uh, touring down through the WTBS studios over the years and long murals down hallways telling Ted's story, you know, I mean, he, yes. he was worshiped there, but now, and, and we're not going to dig into this now, but you know what? I think we're going to have to come back and talk some more, but you know, <laughs> TBS as part of the whole Warner and now Warner disco and yeah. 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 That That's uh, it. It's yeah. I'll just one one other quick Ted. Monty and I went down after that before we made the final decision. We went down to visit Ted in his, his office. His money said, I, "I just can't do this thing unless we go see him at his place and, yep. and you know get some additional G two on on who this guy is." Yeah, yeah. And we went down to visit him, and and during the meeting, Ted Ted had had to uh, to go uh, relieve himself. And so he had an office door right there that opened into a, into a laboratory and, sure. and uh, he went in there. He didn't even close the door. He just took a leak uh, <laughs> and, 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 we, and, and kept talking. We, we were, well, we're, yeah, I mean, you know, <laughs> it was it was that was standard, standard Ted. Why, why stop now? We're talking. <laughs> exactly. By the way, I looked it up. The thriller from Manila was Ali and Frazier. Okay, that's what I had, a Frazier. I had. I had a feeling. Foreman came along later. Yeah, because many years later, when we started the Television Food Network at the Providence Journal, okay, um, my wife uh, Vicky uh, went down to New York three days a week from Providence to work at the Food Network. Okay, okay? and and she put together uh, some of their their events and so on, uh, like uh, feeding the hungry. Right. which was a big deal done every year, raised a lot of money on, on the Food Network for that. Um, and uh, she, um, um, I'm trying to... Yeah, she got together with um, Ali, uh, no, with Foreman and Frazier. Right. Foreman and who did not like each other, 
by the way. Of course. And there's very funny stories that come out of that. But she put together a chili cook-off. Oh, my Lord. Uh, uh, between the firemen and the police in New York as as one of the the deal. And the, and the judges were uh, Foreman and Frazier. <laughs> now, there's there's a video of that somewhere. I might have to go look for that. <laughs> exactly. That's a riot. Yeah. Foreman, right. Foreman, Foreman arrived with his kids on the subway. Frazier took a green limo up from Philadelphia. <laughs> yeah, there you go. Well, I'm a subway rider myself. You know what, Craig? We've 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 covered our half hour and we haven't taken any of your career. I think we've covered about two years. So we're going to have to keep this up and come back and do it again because the purpose of this show, and I actually didn't give this pitch, so I'll do it now. We are telling the story about how the business got to where it is today and where it's going. And as this logo here says that it's sponsored by Sindeo at the right. Cable Center. And over here, it's produced in cooperation with the National Association of Broadcasters. So Trig Marin. Thank you. We're going to have to do this again, man. We got a lot more to talk about. Listen, I'm ha happy, happy to talk with you, Rick. It, it's uh, I love it that you're doing this, frankly. It's great. <laughs> Thank you, bud. I appreciate. And uh, we will catch everybody on the next episode of Inside Television.